Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 112, May 8th to May 14th, 1863. Last week, we talked about the Battle of Chancellorsville in a beast of an episode. This week, we're going to head out west. Grant is going to be beginning his lightning strikes on a woefully outclassed Pemberton. This is going to be known as a kind of Union Blitzkrieg. We will also talk about further action in Arkansas. First, though, we need to end with the significance of Chancellorsville. Speaking of Chancellorsville, this is a good space to talk about our Patreon episode that should be posted here by certainly the airing of this episode. It goes very well with our Chancellorsville episode last week, and that is a picture slideshow of the first day's battlefield out there. A lot of folks, if you've ever been to Chancellorsville, probably have been around the area where Jackson was wounded, or even probably the Chancellor House area there where the Union Army makes their stand on the third day, maybe even gone out all the way down the Orange Plank Road there and have come in where the Confederates begin their huge flanking attack on the second day, but you probably haven't been to the first day's battlefield, some land that was preserved by the American Battlefield Trust, and there's a nice little set of trails there, and it really gives you a good idea, I think, even with some development in the area of just the topography of the battlefield and maybe why it was so important to get out of the wilderness as well on the part of the Union Army, and then maybe also why it was important for the Confederates to keep them inside the wilderness as well. That kind of gives us a good visual of that. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, we do have a link to the Patreon in the show description, and of course those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. So Chancellorsville is considered to be Lee's greatest victory. There was actually a poll that was posted on the last episode that maybe if you want to weigh in on that, but it's fairly easy to see why many consider it to be his greatest. The odds were stacked so heavily for Hooker. Lee tactically does the unthinkable two separate times in the face of overwhelming numbers. He's able to divide his forces, going against conventional wisdom. He's able to rebound from a setback in terms of the federal march to the wilderness, holding his cool in the face of this adversity. May 3rd left much to be desired, though. These losses started to be too much to take for the rebels. Had there been a more experienced commander other than Stuart, maybe things could have been different. In fact, they could have been greatly altered if Longstreet was able to get back in time. Whether in the wilderness or on the field near Salem Church, things might have been very different. Lee was especially irritated he did not take out the Sixth Corps. Hooker, on the other hand, showed the major flaws in his army. An army that gained morale with him at the helm, confident as they marched off to Kelly's Ford. His reworking of the structure of artillery command was a major hindrance. Obviously, It would have been better if he had kept more cavalry with his army as well. We know that Lee, his counterpart, does have that sense to keep the eyes and ears of the army, so to speak, with him, mostly. Some of his personnel choices were not going to be great fits, which will continue to impact the army as they head into Pennsylvania. Unfortunately for Lincoln, it was more of the same. When told of the news, he would exclaim, My God, what will the country say? At the end of the fighting, though, both armies were in the exact same spot they had started. Not much to gain for the large amount of life lost. For Lee, his setback in terms of the amount of personnel lost is going to weigh heavy on his army. We might get to it when we talk about Gettysburg, which, crazily enough, is right here around the corner. But when we begin that campaign... Lee is going to have to replace a lot of officers. A lot of officers that died on the third day or were wounded on the third day. So he's having this drain in terms of talent 
for men who can lead troops into battle, which is going to be at least into Gettysburg, and then obviously Gettysburg, another huge battle after Gettysburg, is going to start to pose a problem. Many people remember Chancellorsville for an entirely different reason, though. On May 10th, 1863, Stonewall Jackson will die from pneumonia. We need to backtrack and retrace our steps from the night of May 2nd, though. Jackson was hit a handful of times by the North Carolina troops, including his arm. It was determined that he needed to be taken from the battlefield, but in the darkness, he was dropped twice from his stretcher, which possibly is the ultimate cause of his death. It was reported that the stretcher bearers were carrying Jackson shoulder high, which would be quite the fall for a wounded man. He also fell on his left side, possibly opening up the wound, making it harder for Stonewall to fight off any potential infections. Dr. Hunter McGuire would accompany Jackson, riding in an ambulance further to the south. This move was correlated with the potential for Federal Cavalry, a side effect of Stoneman's raid. Eventually, he would be moved to Fairfield Plantation at Guinea Station, the dwelling of Thomas Chandler. In the meantime, Jackson's left arm was amputated as a result of his wounds. In the immediate aftermath of his wounding, Jackson was thought to be improving, though. On May 7th, he would start to turn, his wife and child arriving in time before he fell into a worsened state. McGuire would write down his last words from May 10th. A few moments before he died, he cried out in his delirium, Order A.P. Hill to prepare for action. Pass the infantry to the front rapidly. Tell Major Hawks. Then stopped, leaving the sentence unfinished. Presently, a smile of ineffable sweetness spread itself over his pale face, and he said quietly, with an expression as if of relief, Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. I've seen some sources that have shown in these last words, Jackson is still trying to win a complete victory at the Battle of Chancellorsville. He would have been trying to get A.P. Hill to move forward and attack and cut the Union troops off from U.S. forward. So even in his final moments, he's still thinking about that. Jackson's final resting place would eventually be Lexington, Virginia. The Confederacy would mourn Robert E. Lee saying that Jackson had lost his left arm, but he had lost his right. We have another at least interesting account from Henry Kidd Douglas, and unfortunately, Henry Kidd Douglas is often exaggerating, but I think in this particular passage from his book, we can get the idea of the severity and sort of the general mood around these events. That evening, the news went abroad, and a great sob swept over the Army of Northern Virginia. It was the heartbreak of the Southern Confederacy. On Monday, at the request of the officers of the Stonewall Brigade, I went to ask General Lee if in his judgment it would be proper to permit that brigade or a part of it to escort the remains of General Jackson to Richmond. He received me kindly, listened patiently, and then in a voice gentle and sad replied, I am sure no one can feel the loss of General Jackson more deeply than I do, for no one has the same reason. I can appreciate the feelings of his old brigade. They have reason to mourn for him, for he was proud of them. I should be glad to grant any request they might make to show their regard for him, and I am sorry the situation affairs will not justify me in letting them go to Richmond or even to Lexington. So, Lee's going to deny the request of the Stonewall Brigade to accompany Jackson all the way to his final resting place, but then Kid Douglas is going to be present for the funeral, and he's going to continue here. The next day, the 12th, was a very warm one. There was an immense military and civic pageant, grand, solemn, mournful, to convey the body from the governor's mansion. President Davis and his cabinet were there, Gerald Longstreet, Ewell, Elsie, Pickett, Winder, Garnett, Kemper, Corse, and Commodore French Forrest were the pallbearers. And with all the pomp and circumstance of a warrior's funeral, the dead body of our modest and simple chieftain was borne through the crowds which lined the streets and deposited in stately repose in the capital of the new republic. There the throng pressed through in continuous stream for a first and last view of the great general whom they had learned to honor without seeing and love without knowing. 
Late that night after midnight, when all was quiet, I went alone to the Capitol. The crowd had gone, the doors were closed, and several silent sentinels stood guard at the chamber of death. There was all that was left of the mortal man, a coffin on a low table wrapped in a flag and buried in roses, a faint light of candles, a sentinel moving to and fro with unceasing tread, the high forehead and well-known face, cold and white and firm as marble, the sharp nose and tightly closed lips. There was no voice to respond to a goodbye. I picked up a few flowers and took my last leave of Stonewall Jackson. His death was a shock alike to the South and the North, each believing, from different standpoints and with different sensations, that it was the first mortal wound the Southern Confederacy had received. Naturally, it was no grief to the Army of the Potomac. To the people of the South, it was simply unaccountable. So, we need to say some final words about Stonewall Jackson. Was he a great general, or was he overrated? I will admit that when I was a kid, Stonewall Jackson was my favorite Civil War general, mostly because he was probably the first general I was really introduced to, living not too far from Manassas. But I think the answer to that question is that it's a little of column A, a little of column B. I have heard some historians say Jackson was no Napoleon, and he faced subpar competition usually, most notably in the Valley. Here's the bottom line for me, though. Did Napoleon always face the best generals? If you are not a student of history, can you name any of the generals he beat in his 40 battlefield victories? Probably not. Napoleon was good at overwhelming inferior enemies, but just like Jackson in the Valley. Now we are going to talk about Grant and his blitz in Mississippi. Most people claim that in the face of overwhelming numbers, that is impressive, but Pemberton, spoiler alert, is not going to handle it very well. Do we detract from Grant because of that? I certainly don't think so. I think it is equally as impressive. Jackson goes on to do a good job, if not being a fantastic general, at least having that reputation. Lincoln and the high command of the Army of the Potomac were terrified of the guy. On the flip side, he is a great symbol of morale for the Confederacy. I think that's really the big takeaway that I wanted to get out of reading from Henry Kidd Douglas, regardless of whether he actually has a moment where he goes to where Jackson was lying in state. And, you know, maybe that's just sort of just telling a good story. But I think it gets across just the amount of anguish the Southern people are going to feel that Jackson's gone. There's a great line in there that I think was my favorite in that passage that there are people who are getting their first and last look at the guy. Like they didn't even know really who he was on a personal level, but they did know him as this great general who is winning all these victories. And a lot of times that's probably the more important thing. Does he underperform during the seven days? Yes. Does he do so-so in Antietam and have Jubal early bail him out at Fredericksburg? Also, yes. I don't pretend to scrutinize his other performances, but is it not fair to say he rarely sees defeat on the battlefield, if at all? In a war chock full of generals who definitely do see defeat, I think that's important. On a personal note, I'm more interested in what happens to ordinary people when faced with the opportunity to rise to the occasion. Jackson was ordinary. In fact, you could call him a loser before the war. He had very little friends. He was extremely introverted. His army career had fizzled out. His students did not respect him because he was weird. And he had little in terms of factual family. He faced tragedy at an early age being sent to live with his uncle. But he did stick by his morals and was very pious which is commendable. Lee is going to lose a valuable asset with the death of Jackson. No genius, sure, but a dependable general who is a great negative to the morale of the enemy and a great positive to the morale of his army, and I think that is the true importance of Stonewall. This week, we need to drop back into Mississippi and check to see exactly what is going on with Ulysses S. Grant. When we last left off, Grant had a foothold across the mighty river at Bruinsburg. There was a severe lack of Confederate cavalry or informers who could have located exactly where the Federals were coming ashore. Grant was still anxious to make sure his army got a foothold on the Confederate side of the river. He was in fine spirits, quoted as to having written, When this was effected, I felt a degree of relief scarcely ever equaled since. Vicksburg was not yet taken, it is true, nor were its defenders demoralized by any of our previous moves. 
I was now in the enemy's country with a vast river and the stronghold of Vicksburg between me and my base of supplies. But I was on dry ground, on the same side of the river with the enemy. All the campaigns, labors, hardships, and exposures from the month of December previous to this time that had been made and endured were for the accomplishment of this one object. Logistically, he would not wait for supplies before shoving off, rather having his army live off the land. Fortunately, this was something he was able to do. McLernan's corps would be the first to move out, 22,000 men being ready to go at the beachhead on April 30th. Grant has had his problems with McLernan, this is very true, and he will continue to do so, but he is an aggressive battlefield commander, and in some ways he's going to be exactly what Grant needs for this particular situation. While Ulysses focused on getting McPherson and his corps on the correct side of the river, McLernan would push into the interior. Union soldiers would write about the terrain. In many places the road seems to end abruptly, but we come to the place we find it turning at right angles, passing through narrow valleys, sometimes through hills, and presenting the best opportunity to the rebels for defense if they had but known our purpose. In the darkness on the 30th, they would make contact with the Confederates. In a brief skirmish, both sides would bed down, knowing there would be further action on the 1st. Facing the advancing Yankees was John Bowen and his division that had been stationed at Grand Gulf. With the transports bypassing that area, Bowen knew that there would be a landing, but he did not know where. Once the Yankees came ashore, he would dispatch his brigades to the south, blocking two roads further inland to a town called Port Gibson. These two roadways were the Bruinsburg Road and the Rodney Road, the Bruinsburg Road swinging to the north before it cut east. Now, despite having to divide his already outnumbered command, Bowen would be aided by the terrain. There were several ridges and valleys and dips in the elevation containing heavy wooded growth, a possible way to even the odds. Bowen had some capable commanders and veteran troops. Martin Green had a brigade of Arkansas troops along the Rodney Road. General William Tracy was further north on the Bruinsburg Road. Tracy was a former lawyer, a Georgia native who had moved to Alabama and now commanded a brigade of Alabama regiments. Francis Cockrell was also commanding a brigade, Cockrell being a politician from Missouri and a fiery commander in the field. William Baldwin also commanded a brigade, a South Carolinian turned Mississippi man. He had surrendered at Fort Donelson, spent some time in Union prison before being exchanged and will be destined to repeat the process in 1863. All in all, it was not a bad force to slow the Yankees, but it was imperative that Pemberton speed reinforcements if Bowen was to control the beachhead. May 1st would open up with McLernan sending Peter Osterhaus and his division to the north along the Bruinsburg Road, while Carr's and Hovey's divisions would lead the way on the Rodney Road. We mentioned that the Confederates were experienced troops, but we know these names from previous campaigns as well. Osterhaus and Carr both did well at Pea Ridge, Carr receiving the Medal of Honor, while Hovey had participated in the assaults on Fort Hindman at Arkansas Post. Their numbers would be key. Green was set up just before Ridgeline at Magnolia Church. Faced with large numbers of the enemy, he would have to withdraw his skirmish lines and prepare for the possibility of being flanked. Tracy would receive a message to send help to stem the tide of the two divisions he faced. The brigade commander on the Bruinsburg Road was having issues of his own, though, faced with Osterhaus. Still, he would send a regiment and guns to aid his comrades on the southern approach. Artillery would open up in a 45-minute duel between the 7th Battery Michigan Light Artillery and the Botetourt Battery of Virginia, who were down to two guns. This would be the only unit of Virginians to serve in the campaign, already having had a tough time in arriving. We reached Big Black about 12 o'clock at night, and were engaged from that time until daylight, marching about one mile. We had to pass through mud in which the guns would sink up to the axle trees, and the horses mirrored so deep that they couldn't pull out at all and had to be taken out. The guns and caissons had to be pulled out by hand, having to take the ammunition chest off before they could be moved at all. We finished ferrying our battery over around daylight, 
on the morning of the 30th and then moved on toward Grand Gulf without stopping to feed the horses. So it gives you a good idea. It's, it's the terrain here is not necessarily conducive to these armies operating. It is during the artillery duel between the Federal Pieces and the Virginians that Tracy will be struck in the neck and killed. Osterhaus's Federals by this point have been moving up for an assault, but were slowed by the terrain before them. Back on the Rodney Road, the situation was looking dire for the Confederacy. The Alabama regiment sent from Tracy arrived just in time to be thrown into the fray. This regiment, along with the 6th Mississippi, would be badly mauled by the Federal artillery whose superiority was on clear display during the battle. Hovey's division would arrive and deploy along with cars. McClernand also had A.J. Smith's division arriving from Bruinsburg, which he would use to overwhelm the enemy. Initial assaults by the 34th Indiana and the 56th Ohio would be repulsed by the artillery, but a general assault would be ordered afterward, Green's line being forced to fall back yet again. Federals would capture two guns that had been sent from the Virginians as well. Bowen was desperate for more rebels to bolster his lines. Baldwin's and Cockrell's brigades would arrive to shore up a new position, but it would be these troops and not much else. Pemberton had dispatched Wing Loring's division, but they were not going to get there anytime soon. The advice given to Bowen by his superior was simply whip them before Loring gets there. Now, that's interesting. Just go ahead and knock out these guys before Lauren gets there, and then it won't be a problem, right? Such an interesting suggestion. And I think it's just more evidence about how Pemberton is sort of outclassed. He really doesn't understand the situation on the ground here. Fortunately for Bowen, McClernand had stopped to give a speech to his men after the successful capture of the initial lines of the rebels. Grant was also on the field, and would remind the commander of the 13th Corps that the enemy was still in fact there, and reforming. A renewal of the assault would be necessary. McClernand formed up Hovey and Carr, who would be followed by Smith. Martin Green had been sent to the Bruinsburg Road to shore up the Alabama regiments holding on there. Baldwin and Cockrell would provide fresh troops to meet the Federals. But as the Union boys marched out from the Magnolia Ridge, Bowen realized that he would not be able to hold it for long. With their larger numbers, they would be able to flank the gray line. Cockrell would attempt to throw the enemy off balance. McClernand was gearing up for a large assault in the center. The Missourian would hit the right flank of the Northerners and see some short-lived success. Fresh troops would be deployed, pushing the Southerners back. Osterhaus was reinforced with John Logan's division, so the situation was much the same for the rebels there. Bowen would withdraw across Bayou Pierre, but still with no reinforcement, he would retire from the field. Port Gibson had been a good opportunity for the rebels to stop Grant before he made any headway, but it was an opportunity that was spoiled. Bowen was determined, but lacking in resources. The Federals lost 861 in casualties compared to 767 Confederates, showing that the rebels still suffered greatly. Now Grant and his army now had a decision to make. They could move directly north to Vicksburg, as there was a road leading in that direction. But Grant knew that his supply situation was not fully taken care of, and that the Confederates, if properly supplied, might hold the advantage over him by this route. To completely cut off Pemberton from his supply, and base of reinforcement would be necessary. Federals would advance with the Big Black River on their flank in the direction of Jackson, the capital and key rail hub for supply. It would be this location that Joseph E. Johnson was arriving in an effort to raise an army and support Vicksburg. Pemberton would be indecisive during this time and not move out from his defenses until the Union movements were well underway. We need to talk a little bit about what exactly hamstrung the Confederates in this campaign, and that is that they had the wrong personnel at the wrong time. John C. Pemberton was a little bit better at administration than battlefield command. And at a time when the rebels desperately needed a field commander, he was just simply not the right fit. 
Joseph E. Johnson was a reluctant fighter, as we have seen from his time in the East. His assessment, unsurprisingly so, was to give up Vicksburg and combine the armies, which is not really a bad idea. But had that happened, what probably would have occurred is that Johnson would have given up ground to Grant until he was forced by Davis to make a stand. In terms of numbers, Grant has roughly the same amount of men that the Confederates do during this part of the campaign. He will be reinforced later during the siege, but it is not until that point that the overwhelming numbers of the North come into play. Pemberton is ordered by Davis to hold Vicksburg at all costs, obviously Jefferson being a little sore at his home state that has now been invaded. With that directive in mind, Pemberton is going to put too much emphasis on holding the city. Grant would advance in early May, with McClernand closest to the Big Black River and McPherson laid out a little further inland. Sherman would be in position to provide support to either, especially the inexperienced McPherson and his 17th Corps. Pemberton would meanwhile start to bolster his defenses at various river crossings. He did not believe that there was really a threat posed by Federals moving in their northeasternly direction. This, he concluded, was more than likely a feint to draw away his defenders so that the May Army could take a more direct route. Texan John Gregg would be sent to Raymond with his brigade to engage Union troops in the vicinity. These men were said to number less than Gregg's force, so it would just be to keep the feint in check. What Gregg did not know was that he was running into McPherson's entire corps. On May 12, 1863, there would be skirmishing between militia and the main federal column. Militiamen would fall back to Raymond and inform Gregg of the large number of Northerners. Gregg believed that there was some exaggeration amongst the militia and was settled down in his defensive line along 14 Mile Creek. He had some artillery, but was concerned at the Union superiority in that area. He planned to hold the enemy in check with part of his force while using two regiments to flank across the river and, if possible, take care of the enemy guns. This move would initially catch the Union by surprise, routing an entire Ohio regiment. The 7th Texas and the 3rd Tennessee actually had much more success in their holding motion, getting across the creek and at the enemy. John Logan would have to stabilize his line as the Confederate attack sputtered out. The two sides would engage each other for some time across the creek. McPherson, new to command, did two things wrong. First, he overestimated the enemy he was facing, believing them to be far more than a brigade. Second, he waited just a tad too long before throwing in reinforcements. This period in May was especially dry, so large clouds of dust combined with battle smoke would make it difficult to see the battlefield and judge the enemy's strength to be fair to McPherson. When he did throw in Marcellus Crocker's division, commanded by our old friend from Iuka, John Sanborn, the tide would turn for the Union. John Stevenson's brigade, as well as John Smith's, would be engaged from Logan's division. These brigades included the 31st Illinois, known as the Dirty First, Logan's Old Command, and the 45th Illinois, known as the Lead Mine Regiment, mostly supplied with former lead miners in its ranks. Also participating in the fight and taking the brunt of a charge by the 30th Tennessee was the 7th Missouri, also known as the Irish 7th. Punctuated by heavy hand-to-hand -hand fighting between the two sides, Gregg was forced to withdraw. Union soldiers would reportedly feast on fried chicken that had been laid out in Raymond for the potential victorious Confederates. Casualties would count 515 roughly on the Confederate side, as opposed to 446 on the Federal side. Again, the figures would be fairly close, just as they had been at Port Gibson. Gregg had been unable to accurately assess the Federal strength and lost a valuable cannon on the field but he did show good tactics and a flank movement that if he had more resources might have worked. McPherson, on the other hand, did not have a good showing as a corps commander. As mentioned, he waited a long time before throwing in reinforcements and would do so in a piecemeal faction. 
he had won the field, but at a pretty high cost for the amount of troops engaged. One of the consequences out of the Battle of Raymond was that Grant concluded that Jackson needed to be officially neutralized before his full attention could be paid on Vicksburg. McPherson and Sherman were both dispatched to eliminate the Mississippi capital. Joseph Johnson had arrived and would almost immediately decide that Jackson could not be held against Grant's army. There were some 6,000 men in Jackson itself, but reinforcements were scheduled to arrive. In fact, Jackson, being on the Northern Railroad, as you recall from the Gerson Raid, would aid in potential units coming in to help Johnson. But Johnson, as we mentioned, was not willing to stand and fight if he could withdraw, so he would move his men out of the city. We will get into it a little more next week, but Johnson would start to let Pemberton know that he would withdraw and support him in offensive action, but these were all conflicting. Some sources I have seen say he was sending Pemberton messages because he wanted to cover himself for simply abandoning not only the capital of the state, but also Vicksburg. Could it also be that Johnson did not like Davis and was not willing to play ball with him? I think this could also be a possibility. We've documented how Johnson does not get along with Davis, even all the way back to Virginia in 1862. So it's very likely that Johnson doesn't want to do Davis any favors. We see this sometimes where Braxton Bragg doesn't like certain states. He doesn't like Kentucky, obviously. He may be Johnson, who is sort of this aristocratic Virginian, looks down on Mississippi, especially a guy like Jefferson Davis, who's more, shall we say, new money than the old firm. And Johnson's just not going to click with him and maybe the fact that he doesn't perform very well at all. And I'm not going to hide the fact that I think Johnson essentially has his worst performance of the war and probably one of the worst performances all time of any general during the war here because he doesn't really do anything. So keeping that in mind and how he doesn't get along with Davis, maybe that has a certain amount to do with his performance. Greg was rewarded by being in charge with the rear guard. Johnson making sure he was out of the city. McPherson and Sherman would advance against the rear guards in the Jackson defenses on May 14, 1863. McPherson would meet some resistance from the defenders during a rainstorm, but it would not be a repeat of the battle two days earlier at Raymond. Crocker's division would assault the enemy position and drive the Southerners away. This would be primarily Colquitt's brigade, part of the reinforcements who were arriving into the city to strengthen Johnson's command. I will also mention that the earthworks were reportedly not constructed in a good position. Sherman would have an easier time, only facing a unit of artillery. Jackson would then become yet another rebel capital to fall into the federal hands. Casualty figures I've seen to be all over the place with the Federals probably losing some 300 men compared with maybe 800 Confederates, and that's going to include a lot of captured stragglers. Sherman's Corps would go about destroying the military infrastructure of the city with some looting going on. William T. would try to control these incidents, but he does have Frederick Steele's division, who took particular pleasure in their previous destruction of northern Mississippi. Sherman would return and finish off the city later in the summer, but for now, Grant was able to bring his full attention on John C. Pemberton. So just to backtrack a little bit to close us out today, we have further action with John Marmaduke and his command. When last we left off, Marmaduke had been turned away at Cape Girardeau. After that defeat, the rebel cavalry would conduct a fighting retreat to the St. Francis River, Here was a place called Chalk Bluff, named so for white clay. The problem was that the rebels would need to build a bridge to get over the river. Marmaduke would have his men dig in and face the oncoming Yankees so they could get a bridge built and escape. General William Vanderveer was quickly approaching and would engage the Confederates at the bluff on May 1st. Rearguard activity would begin further out from the defenses. 
The Southerners, though, would suffer fairly heavy casualties, but successfully hold off the Union troops, allowing for the completion of the bridge and escape back into Arkansas. Jeff Thompson actually supervised the construction of the bridge and would make several trips with the raft to get the artillery to safety. Marmaduke would be foiled in his plans to continue his raid into Missouri. Casualties are again pretty widespread, but it's likely some 200 on the side of the rebels compared to 100 on the side of the Union. So, we can call it an episode there. We had Marmaduke's raid wrapping up in Missouri with action at Chalk Bluff. The reason we had this engagement this week was that last week we of course fought the Battle of Chancellorsville, which we also wrapped up this week. There were three battles fought in the campaign for Vicksburg, with Union victories at Port Gibson, Raymond, and Jackson. And I think when you listen to this episode and you just see how far these battles are apart during this campaign, then we really get a good idea of why it's called a Union Blitzkrieg. Next week, we're going to stay in Mississippi and fight the largest battle on the state soil in the Battle of Champion Hill. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback's always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.